Thank you for tuning in to Digging for Truth, where we explore the truth of the Bible and the gospel of Jesus of Nazareth. I'm your host, Henry Smith. Today, we continue our archaeological journey through the Book of Judges with archaeologist Dr. Scott Stripling of the ABR staff and the director of the Shiloh Excavations. Well, Scott, welcome back to the show. Hi, Henry. Uh, it's good to be with you. There's a lot in Judges. There certainly is, and that's why we had to we had these have these two episodes together. So we had a wonderful time in our our, our first uh, part of this journey. Let's continue our journey through the Book of Judges. Um, one of the things that we wanted to talk about, uh, some of the judges are obscure to people, but one that certainly isn't obscure is the man of the fleece, and that mm. would be Gideon. Um, tell us a little bit about him and what we might know from the archaeological record related to him. Well, we didn't know anything until uh, 2021, and this is why you know, we were talking in the last episode about Kushan Rishathaim, and we now know more about Othniel. We also now know more about uh, Gideon, so you can only imagine in the coming years the, the types of things that archaeology is going to turn up. There was an Ostrakhan that Yossi Garfinkel uncovered at a site called Kerbet el Rai, which is about two and a half miles from, uh, from Lachish. It was on a storage jar, and so we can date the type of storage jar. We were all, they also did carbon dating on the contents of the jar. It dates to around 1100. There were several fragments of the jar, I think seven total, that uh, three of which, when put together, had the name Jerubbabel. Well, the Bible says that this is another name for Gideon, and Gideon dates to around 1100. So, you know, you dig into that a little bit, and the biblical story is that uh, Gideon destroys the town of Ophrah, uh, tears down their Asherah poles and their, their altar to Baal, so good for him. Uh, but then, then the people are in an uproar <laughs> that because he did this, and Gideon's father sort of mocks them and says, "Well, you know, if you think that's it, then let Baal contend with him, with with Gideon, his son, which is what Jarababel Baal at the end. That's what that means. Uh, the Lord, the Lord contends with him. So Gideon goes by sometimes the name Jarababel, and what do we find on this shirt? What did they find at Kerbet el Rai? Uh, the, the name Jerubbabel. So um, we don't know that it was our Jerubbabel for sure. Uh, it could be, but we know that that was a name that was in use at that time, and we now have it on a on an ostracon. Yeah, I was fascinated by that when that was discovered. One of the one of okay. So I heard you say the pottery fits the biblical chronology, and the carbon fourteen dating fits the biblical chronology. Um, do we? Oh, know? and the epigraphy, by the way. So okay, the, the style of writing. So it's a three, yeah, well, threefold matrix. Threefold. So that's what we all, we love to do is to triangulate when you're getting a date. So it's what normally epigraphers refer to a proto Canaanite script and uh, morphing they would think into a Hebrew script. We of course know that it's, we actually have a Hebrew script older than this, but uh, uh, so uh, you're you're seeing this this transitional script because Canaanites and Hebrews are using the same uh, alphabet. Um, and also a lot of the same words. So it's that proto-Canaanite, proto-Hebrew script. So really interesting. So it all, it all sort of fits together. Now, do, have we found any, uh, do we know if this was a common name, like in any way? Has this ev name ever been found elsewhere before? Is this unique as far as we know? And now, to my knowledge, it's, it's uh, first found there and only found there. Um, and that's that's really really interesting. With time, maybe we'll find other mentions of it in other places. But we know it in the Bible, and now we know it from this this Sostracon. At, at the very least, if we if we we don't maybe want to jump and say it's Gideon himself, but it shows you the name is using is being used contemporaneously with the reference in the biblical text, right right place, right time, etc. So really fascinating, and only in 2021, Scott. So you know, yeah. It, it's this is this is the thing that's so great about archaeology. It's just, you know, truth springs from the earth, brother. And uh, you pick the right field to go into. I know, I'm having the time <laughs> of my life. I know you are. I know you are. Okay, so now we want to shift a little bit to a famous um, uh, temple, the Temple of Baal Barith, uh, and I'll let you explain what that is and where that is. Well, there's our there's Baal again. So in remembering Canaanite mythology, Baal is the storm god, and he's the son of El and Asherah. 
And so we see his name in Jerub Babel, and now we have the Temple of Baal Berith. So, you know, it's a big deal. This is a major Canaanite uh, deity. And there is a temple mentioned three times in the book of Judges, chapters uh, 8 and 9, and it is at Shechem. So uh, they, they seek a refuge in the temple of Baal Berith. Well, in the excavations at uh, Shechem, indeed, a temple was found that dated to that time period, and uh, it's easily visible today. But folks can visit the site and see the remains of that temple that's mentioned in the book of uh, Judges. And I think the main thing I want to underscore here, Henry, is that the book of Judges is dealing with real people, real places, and real events. And so when we're talking about these various judges, Othniel and Gideon and uh, Jephthah and so forth, we have archaeology that matches it. So these are not just mythological, ateleological stories that are they're, you know, written whole cloth and put together to give us some sort of morality tale. They really happened. Yeah, yeah, and the remarkable uh, detail of the of the text and what it is, and and uh, uh, folks, if they ever get an opportunity to come to Shiloh to serve uh, as a volunteer, we uh, as long as circumstances allow, we almost always find a way to get to Shechem because you right. could, you could go there and, and see it. It's incredible uh, the, the archaeological discoveries that have been found there. Um, Probably a less no, well-known thing. I just want you to comment on this for just a moment. Um, we see the appearance of villages in the central hill country that sort of pop up 13th century, right in the middle of the judges period. What's our general interpretation of that in the archaeological record in comparison to the text? Well, and those who do hold to a, a late date for the Exodus would point to that. They would say, you know, why do we have uh, a proliferation of these small villages in the central highlands um, around the year 1200. <clears throat> and um, indeed, that's what we do at Kerbet el Makader. You know, our, our site was rebuilt around that time, maybe 40, 50 people living there. And there are hundreds of those little villages that, that pop up. So I, I, if we follow the biblical text, the clues are embedded in the text itself. When the Israelites came into the land, remember Deuteronomy 7.7, 7, God said, I did not choose you because you were greater in number than these nations. I chose you because you were few in number. And so I think you have a small number of Israelites, and God told them, <clears throat> you're going to live in houses you did not build. You're going to occupy cities you did not construct. And then throughout the period of the judges, we do not see much demographic growth because it says in the text that God is allowing them to be defeated by their enemies. Uh, the curses in Deuteronomy are your wives are not going to carry children to term and so forth if you turn away from the Lord. And they're continually you know, going through these cycles of apostasy and then repentance. Uh, but around the year 1200, they finally do reach sort of a critical demographic growth where now they have outgrown these old Canaanite cities and they have moved out into the central highlands where they had been nomadically or semi-nomadically. And they begin to construct um, what you would see a normal demographic pattern. And our friend Titus Kennedy incidentally did his doctoral dissertation on this topic of demographic patterns in the late Bronze Age in Canaan. Yeah, it's good stuff. So it, it fits with, within the Bible, even stuff that's not directly mentioned, just the context of what's happening in Scripture, the growth of Israel as a nation. All right, Scott, well, we do need to take a break, and we'll be right back after this message. In a culture of intense Bible-denying skepticism, Associates for Biblical Research exists to strengthen followers of Jesus by affirming the authority of the Bible. Our archaeological fieldwork and original research form a strong foundation in upholding the reliability of the scriptures. For students or anyone asking if they can really trust the Bible, please visit our website and partner with us by joining our prayer team or financially supporting this ministry. And thank you for standing with us. Hi, welcome back to Digging for Truth. Dr. Scott Stripling is with us today. We're talking about the Book of Judges and archaeology. Okay, Scott. Um, Let's talk about an interesting character that we're going to sort of set up our next segment and we're going to talk about. We promised people that we would talk about your cutting-edge research on Shiloh. We're going to connect these up together. Um, let's talk about a guy named Jephthah. Je uh, yes. Judges chapter 11. and Spend some time talking about him. 
Yeah, well, he actually starts in chapter 10 and goes into chapter 12. So it's a pretty major period of time. And Jephthah, as we might say, was bad to the bone. So he's uh, in the Transjordan <clears throat> region. And in chapter 11, we have a really nice synchronism that also supports the early date of the Exodus and conquest. And in uh, verse 26, Jephthah says to the Ammonite king who's trying to seize this, this land that the Israelites have already been in this land, he said, for 300 years. Well, if we date him to around 1100, which everyone does, and we add 300 years to it, that means around 1400 when they would have conquered the Transjordan, and that is spot on with what, with what we read in the Bible. And so people who are trying to, they, they don't want to accept an early date, they've come up with some critiques of that, so what you might say opposition arguments. And one thing that has been raised is that he mentions um, the wrong God here. So um, he says, your God, why, why didn't your God, Kamash, give, give this land to you? And so folks have said, wait a minute, that's, that's, that's not correct. That, that's, Kamash was not the God of the, of the Ammonites. So um, shall we dig into that a little bit? Yeah, let's, let's do that. So, so what's that first implication? If, the, he, if he supposedly got the God wrong, then maybe he got the 300-year marker wrong as well. Is that the, is that the leap yeah. of logic that's taken? That's kind He's of a fallacy. That's, that's a fallacy. Isn't it? He's an unreliable source, is yeah. what they would say. He's proven that he doesn't know what's going on because he doesn't even know who their god was. Because he's a country bumpkin, is what they would say. Yeah, he's an yeah. Unreliable source. We, we call that a person ad hominem. Uh, that's not a that's not a very good <laughs> thought argument. Even a broken. I don't think they would say that to Jephthah's face, by the way, because he was he was pretty bad dude. Yeah, yeah. Even a broken clock is right twice a day, right? <laughs> so okay, so this god Shemash, uh, the claim here is that this is not the Ammon. God, and so therefore Jephthah's in error. Um, explore that a little bit more. Tell us your thoughts on that, and and what 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 we might might be a more nuanced view of that. The 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 gods of these surrounding nations are all interesting, and sometimes there's different names. Same god, you know, going by different names. This Transjordan region. This was originally Moabite land. It then was conquered by the Amorites. The Israelites then conquered the Amorites when they arrived at Sihon and Og. So you've got a change of possession, just like, you know, I'm in Texas. We've got six flags over Texas, you know, different entities that have ruled Texas over the years. So you had Moabites were in charge. They had one set of gods. Then you had Amorites who came in with some different gods. And then they're conquered by the Israelites, who are, of course, monotheistic, at least most of the time. So the, the, the god of the the Ammonites, who never controlled the territory, incidentally. So it's Moabites, Amorites, Israelites. Ammonites never had control of it. Um, so their god is Moloch. So it. the critics would say that Jephthah should have said, your god, Moloch. But I think, Henry, what he's doing is he's poking fun at them. He's saying, your god, Kamash, Shamash, in other words, oh, you must, you must not be Ammonites, you must be Moabites, your God Kamash, because they could make a claim to it, because they used to control this, but you guys never have. Yeah, yeah, so a couple things there. One is there might be more, new. you're suggesting there might be more nuance, there could be sarcasm that's involved here, but even if he just made a, a blunder, let's just maybe if we conceded that for the sake of argument, that doesn't mean that the 300 fear, year figure is a blunder, which we mentioned already. So it's really kind of like much ado about nothing almost. I mean, um, yeah. right? I mean, and, and, and when you're quoting a person from the past, you want to try to, how can we find a way that this person may be speaking truthfully before we proclaim that they're wrong or lying? Maybe tell talk about that a little bit. Well, he, even if you would, uh, said this intentionally, um, these gods can be worshipped in multiple cultures. And yeah, so it yeah. very well could have been that Kamash was being worshipped also at that time, and we just don't know about it. And we have numerous examples of this uh, across cultures with Marduk and, and other gods as well. Um, real quickly, I have written the archaeological supplement for a new study Bible that will be coming out um, by hopefully by the end of this year called the Open Study Bible. And I have a section on that in there. So folks who are interested can keep an eye out for the Open Study Bible coming uh, down the pike from uh, HarperCollins later this year. Oh, well, that's fantastic. Okay, so now people have heard us mention a couple of times 
uh, here uh, about this original research related to Shiloh uh, and the Amarna letters and sort of, so let, let's give an introduction to that, Scott, and then in our last segment, we're going to explore that further together, uh, uh, maybe about a minute, if you would, boss. Okay, well, here's the thing. Jephthah is still the judge in, in view, and we, we're dealing with El Amarna 288, and EA 288 refers to Silu. So it's one of the letters from Abdihiba, king of Jerusalem, and he's crying out to Pharaoh for help, and he's saying that these other sites have fallen. And he mentions, for, for example, Lachish. And then he says Silu, well, Critics like um, Albright and uh, Hoffmeyer and others have tried. I guess maybe critics isn't the right word. I'll just say that some scholars have identified Silu with a fort down in Egypt, and uh, this is uh, Rainey also recently. So even though Condor, who was in the 1880s, 1890s, he was the first one to ever write about this, he identified it as Shiloh. But that has been deeply lost in the research, and in the last several generations, there's been this sort of general agreement that Silu is referring to Shiloh, and that's what I want to talk about in the next segment. All right, well, we're going to do that. We're going to take a quick break, and we'll be right back. ABR is excited to announce the publication of Volume 2 from our excavations at Kerbet el Makater. The volume details archaeological remains from about 350 B.C. to the 8th century. This includes a New Testament village that may have been visited by Jesus. Over 400 pages of analysis, photos, and maps. You can pick up a copy today by visiting BibleArchaeology.org. Hi, welcome back to Digging for Truth. Dr. Scott Stripling is here with us talking about the archaeology of the Judges period. Now, Scott, um, you've been doing some or really original research on this question of does the name Shiloh appear in the Amarna letters? Uh, and you've set that up already in our last segment. Let's talk some more about that. I, I, I'm dying to know more. Um, Clyde Billington and I are have just co-authored an article uh, on this topic, which will be included in the new Festriff that the Near East Archaeological Society is publishing for Edwin Yamauchi in honor of his 90th birthday. And in our research, we were trying to look at, it seemed clear that Silu does refer to Shiloh, even though Rainey and Moran and others had, had identified it with this fort down in Egypt. And there's a number of problems with it being a fort in Egypt, like why would Pharaoh need to be notified that a fort in Egypt was under attack? And if it's a fort, aren't there soldiers that are stationed there already? <laughs> and there's no other site in Egypt mentioned in any of the 382 Amarna letters. So if it was, then it's the only one that would have this. And so just lots of lots of problems with this. And it seemed to fit very naturally that the king of Jerusalem, which is just 19 miles from, from Shiloh, would be informing, that's his job, is to inform Pharaoh of what's going on around him. So at Lachish and at Shiloh. So as I, I dug into this, I found a lot of reasons to, to, to believe that that was indeed the case, but I thought one thing that bothered me was the S and the SH sound. So uh, we have in, in Hebrew, both both sounds exist, SH and S, but not all letters, uh, not all languages have both. So the in the Amarna tablet, 288, it says Silo, but in the Bible, it's Shilo, Shiloh. So why isn't there an SH sound? And so Clyde and I were grappling with this, and we we're looking at, at Ugaritic and, you know, languages of surrounding countries and so forth. And lo and behold, it was right there in chapter 12 of Judges, dealing with our old friend Jephthah. <laughs> okay, so um, tell us about that. I'm, I'm just going to let you go with it. Go for it. Okay, well, here's what happens. Um as I said, Jephthah is in the Transjordan. The men of Ephraim uh, territory, which is where Shiloh is located, central central hill country, large area. The men of Ephraim cross over the Jordan River from the west to the east. They have a battle with Jephthah, and they lose. They get beaten badly, and they are retreating across the Jordan to go back to Ephraim uh, territory. The primary city of which is, is Shiloh. And so what Jephthah does is he sets up a checkpoint at the border, um, at the fjords of the Jordan, and anyone who's trying to cross over, they say to the men, 
this is a really curious story, Judges 12, 1 through 7, say Shibboleth. And if they say Sibboleth, okay. they cannot pronounce the SH sound, then Jephthah and his men kill them. They put them to death. In other words, they're, they're from Ephraim territory. They're the enemy at this point if they cannot pronounce the SH sound. So what this tells us is that there is a dialect of Hebrew spoken at this time where there is no SH sound. That's what the Bible says. And what do we have in the Amarna letters synchronizing with this? We have Silu, and it's written from the people of Ephraim. So how do they pronounce Shiloh? They pronounce it as Silu. And so this is what was so fascinating to us that the the answer wasn't in the Ugaritic. <laughs> the answer was right there in the biblical text. Right there in the Hebrew Bible. Okay, so so uh, let's explore this a little bit more. Uh, uh, tell tell the audience what a shibboleth is. What that what does that oh. mean? And and it does seem like a strange story, but, you know, because it's so foreign to our context. Uh, a little bit, of, maybe a little bit about that. Yeah, well, I don't remember what a shibboleth is. Okay, but I know it's a it, it's a term. It's an idiomatic expression that we use even in English, like when we say a shibboleth. You know, somebody can't pronounce something uh, correctly. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, I've read that story so many times and I never thought that it would come to bear in archaeological research. Yeah, it's it's so interesting too. the the you know, it, it's hard to imagine well, why would you kill people just because you can't pronounce a word, but it has a, has to do with this war that's going on. This is part of the picture of the judges period too, Scott. Like this is the degradation and depravity of what's happening to the Israelites because of the idolatry. They're killing each other. It's uh it's yeah. uh, it's tragic. Well, I think that Abdihiba, the king of Jerusalem, when he has heard the people of Ephraim pronounce where they live, they pronounce it without the SH sound. Yeah. It's later written with the Nikudats and so forth. It's later written into the Hebrew text as SH, but at the time it would have been pronounced as uh, as Silu. You see it on the Madaba map, uh, for example, too, which is written in Greek, Silu, where the Ark stayed. So some languages like Latin and Greek do not have the SH sound. Hebrew does. This explains it to us that one of the dialects of Hebrew being spoken at that time, just like even today, we have regional dialects in the United States where we pronounce some words differently. Um, they clearly had that at that time. Excellent, excellent. Boy, the nuances of language, and right there, the answer is in the biblical text, and it's contemporaneous. It's at that time period. Yeah. So it got, kind of gives you a picture of uh, what, what what would it be, a, a grammar or a lexicon snapshot of, hey, they said it this way, and then we have this tablet that fits with Shiloh. I love it, Scott. I, I It's just so intriguing. Can't wait to right. read that when it comes out. One more thing. Sure. Since we now know this, that places... The, 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 the dating of that story, it places it for us very nicely, and it also synchronizes well with the Amarna letters and the early date for the Exodus, because we can date those Amarna tablets. Yeah, it all, all, all fits in nicely. Okay, Scott, well, it's been a, a quite a journey through Judges. I can give you about a minute just to summarize the importance of all this. I know it's a tough task, but please go for it. Well, uh, the, the Judges is a continuation. It's not like the conquest ends in the book of Joshua. Um, and we see this with Othniel, the very first judge. He is a direct descendant of Caleb. And so it's a continuation where they are continuing to gradually possess the land. The problem is sin. And so as they apostatize and turn away from the Lord, they're, they're falling under judgment. They're being conquered. Then at times God's raising up judges. Interestingly, we have synchronisms with a number of these judges that are mentioned that we were able to talk about today. And so it's fascinating to see that when we read the the book of Judges, we're dealing with real people, real places, real events. Those of us working in the highlands of Israel encounter them quite a bit. Amen. Well, Scott, thanks for all the hard work and uh, for coming on the show and just doing an excellent job of teaching us and, and uh, uplifting us and edifying us to believe what God has said in the scriptures. I love you, man. I appreciate you. I my, my pleasure. Blessings, Henry. All right. Well, friends, thank you for watching Digging for Truth today. You know, the word that's used to describe the judges is deliverers in the Old Testament. This is the same word that refers to the Messiah, a deliverer. Um, but in the case of the judges, the deliverer is only temporary. The situation remains the deliverer dies, and then the people go back to apostasy. Well, in the case, we have a deliverer named Jesus, who permanently delivers us from the dominion of sin. And uh, when he returns and comes back to 
inaugurate a new heavens and new earth, we'll have a situation where we'll never fall back into those kind of conditions again. Uh, we hope you'll consider this truth today and thank you for supporting the ministry of ABR. Digging for Truth is produced and recorded in the studios of Lighthouse TV. Positively different.